For those of you who are watching live, good morning. If you're streaming Sunday afternoon or throughout the rest of the week, thank you for making us part of your day. Just a reminder, if you have kids age four to grade six, we have Kids Church live on Zoom every Sunday morning at 9.30. You can find the link on the front page of our website for join us at church online and then follow the directions from there. Let's ask God to bless our service. Heavenly Father, we are reminded that you cannot cancel Christmas and that whatever happens all around us, that you are the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As we sing, as we listen to the Mel's message, and as we spend time with our family, may you be glorified and exalted above all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for Ellerslie Church's online tradition service. Let's open in prayer. Dear God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we gather for worship on this first Advent Sunday with the desire to exalt you as our King and God. May our praises rise as incense before your throne. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's join together in singing, Come, Thou Almighty King. Call to worship today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 9, where the Apostle Paul writes, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus, for in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. Let's continue to sing our praise to God with this chorus, Faithful One.
As we prepare to hear from God's word today, join us again as we sing this final song, Here is Love, Vast as an Ocean. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness of the flood, when the prince of life are ransomed. Shed for us his precious blood, who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise, he can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. On the mount of crucifixion. i uh -huh. 
Let's pray together. Dear God, our loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of calling upon you as Father and for Jesus, your Son, whom you sent into this world as our Savior. We ask with the psalmist today, give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. As we have once again entered into this Advent season, we are reminded of the promises of long ago, given through the mouths of your prophets. Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old. And the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will never judge by appearance, false evidence, or hearsay. He will defend the poor and the exploited. He will rule against the wicked and destroy them with the breath of his mouth. He will be clothed with fairness and truth. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus into this world in fulfillment of your word. May you be praised both now and forevermore for the salvation offered to mankind through the gift of your Son, who delighted in doing your will. May we, as your children, follow his example, all the while being reminded throughout this Advent season that just as you fulfilled your promise in sending Jesus so long ago, you will again fulfill your promise to send him the second time. We look forward in faith to the accomplishment of your plan and purposes in the time that you have set. Holy Spirit, continue to work in us till Jesus comes again. Help us to realize that regardless of all the things happening around us, that God the Father is still in control, and you are accomplishing his purposes in us as your children. May our prayer continually be that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heavenly Father, we pray for the church, Christ's body scattered around the world, spread out through all nations. We ask on behalf of brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering persecution for the sake of his name, that your Holy Spirit be their constant strength and hope. In the face of imprisonment or even death, fill them with the hope that we have in Christ and his resurrection. May their witness stir up faith in others and give confidence of your ever-present help in times of trouble. We also pray for the church in Canada, where our freedoms to gather have been restricted and adjustments are being made as to how we can continue to fulfill our mission. As we work toward the goal of making disciples fill our hearts with compassion for those who are lost and without hope in the chaos and confusion of our rapidly changing world. Revive the hearts of your people. Stir up in us a desire to seek first your kingdom and righteousness. Again, we intercede for our country's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, and our provincial premier, Jason Kenney. In the wake of difficult decisions they must make, grant them wisdom and wise counselors to assist in the process. Again, we ask that your unseen hand guide them in the decisions that they must make. Heavenly Father, we now bring our intercessions closer to home to our Ellerslie family and pray specifically for Bill and Liz Immersale with his declining health situation Strengthen this family as together they walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Help them to fear no evil, for you are with them. And for our global mission partners, David and Andrea McCormick, who are serving orphaned children in Guatemala, not being sure of their current situation, Father, we pray that you will guide them in whatever matters are concerning their ministry in these days. Now, as your word is proclaimed today, give us an open mind and a heart to receive the truths that you have for us to live out in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A lot has been canceled over the last number of months. Sports were canceled, some businesses were canceled, even social gatherings have been canceled. But thankfully, Jesus reminds us that as hard as some people might try, church is not canceled. This past week, our staff leadership team has made the difficult decision that while church is definitely not canceled, 
we are suspending meeting on site from now until January 3rd, and we'll be meeting exclusively online starting next Sunday. Well, this news is certainly hard to hear. We've also worked hard at creating ways to celebrate at home, and one of the ways we can do this is by picking up Christmas in a bag. For only $20 per household, you'll receive a weekly activity, discussion around the Christmas story, and a treat for the entire family. If you're here on site, you can pick one up directly following the service, and for everyone else, you can stop by the office during office hours. We'd be happy to talk to you for a couple minutes and set you up with a bag for a Christmas season. Every single week, we talk about giving and the power and impact that it makes in our local church and around the world. Back on Thanksgiving Sunday, we talked about Emily Fast, one of our mission partners over in the Philippines. It was our goal to raise $4,000. You crushed it. And we raised over $13,000, which is impacting the people in the Philippines more than we could even begin to possibly imagine. So here's a good news from Emily. Hi, Ellersley. I just wanted to send you guys a quick but really big thank you for your Thanksgiving offering a couple weeks ago that's going toward the San Agustin Giving Project. And wow, the amount that you guys sent in is way more than we had ever expected. And it will definitely be able to help even more people than we had initially planned. So I just wanted to thank you guys so much for your generosity and for being a blessing to us and to the people here. God bless. Thank you for your faithful giving, whether to Emily Fast or to the ongoing ministry here at the church. If you would like to continue to do so, there's numerous ways if you go to erbc.ca slash give. Now, grab a pen, a notebook, and your Bible for our brand new sermon series, Can't Cancel Christmas. Early this fall, we decided that the best theme for our Christmas celebrations this year was the bold, bald declaration, Can't Cancel Christmas. It might seem somewhat, well, odd, inconsistent maybe, ironic at least, to introduce that theme today because on this first Sunday of what is traditionally the beginning of the Christmas season and we're beginning our Can't Cancel Christmas teaching theme for this month, we are also having to announce that we've decided that the wisdom way for us is to cancel, oh, sorry, no, we're not using the C word, we are going to suspend our on-site Sunday services until at least January. That won't impact most of you because we'll still be working hard at maintaining our online services and even improving the experience in ways that we can connect better with each other. But we won't be gathering physically for at least five Sundays. You can check our website for an announcement, which will be posted later today about further details on that. So is that ironic timing or what? Well, maybe it's actually good timing because as we've been planning for two months now on how we deliver on this theme, we said to ourselves that we don't have any idea what the Christmas season will bring. So let's put our effort into helping us do Christmas well at home. So maybe the timing is actually, well, you might think we even planned it this way. We didn't. The whole point of this series is to remind ourselves that whatever happens to us in terms of how we are able to celebrate Christmas this year does not mean that Christmas is canceled. You can't cancel what happened. I mean, really, when a baby's born, you can't cancel the birth. You, you can't press rewind, stuff it back in. It's, it's happened. You can't resent it or you can resent it. You can mitigate the results of it. You can reinterpret how it happened. Put whatever spin on it you want. You can react to it in all kinds of unhealthy ways or you can work with it well. One thing you can't do is make it unhappen. Now, I'm pretty personally and quite emotionally engaged in this idea this Christmas. Because 35 years ago this fall, an older teenage girl and her boyfriend conceived a child. Although they had no God influence or even God implication, inclination in her heart that she was aware of, she had a sense that this life that, was part, that she was part of conceiving was human. 
And she could not just cancel it. In the end, she chose to give birth and to adopt that child. She chose us very carefully to be her parents or to be his parents because by that time she had met Jesus and she wanted her son to follow Jesus. Three weeks ago this weekend, that son, a man who loves Jesus and his wife who loves Jesus, gave birth to a child who we think is pretty cool. At least three weeks old, we see indicators that he might be the smartest kid ever born. But here's one of the coolest things. Because this young woman did not live in reaction to or denial of what happened or even try to erase the memory of it, this week, three grandmothers, LaDonna, our son's wife's mother, and his birth mother, got together on Zoom to celebrate the birth of a boy who has three grandmothers in his life, all of whom have dealt with an unplanned birth that happened 34 and a half years ago. You see, if Jesus is who he claimed to be, whom the evidence suggests he is, coming to terms with this birth continually in everything and through everything is absolutely essential. You can't cancel it. It happened. You have to come to terms with it in the most healthy way possible. And so for the next four Sundays, we'll be looking at that from four different angles. Four of the big things can't cancel Christmas implies. Today, we're going to see one huge thing that we need to come to terms with because against all odds, this birth happened. Can't cancel Christmas shows clearly, vividly, dramatically that you can't cancel the plans of God. For almost every one of us this Christmas, there's some kind of plans that have been canceled. Most of us have said, at least in some way, well, I guess that plan goes out the window. For some of us, perhaps big plans. This was supposed to be the year that whatever. And it's led to a variety of understandable emotional reactions, right? Some of us, and that would be me, hadn't made our plans yet. But we're still ticked because COVID canceled the plans we would have made. We'll be looking this morning at the account by the gospel writer Matthew of the birth, life, and teaching, and death of Jesus. Turn to the gospel of Matthew, the, the first book in the part of the Bible we call the New Testament. First book, chapter 2. The second page of the New Testament. This chapter is what we might call the adult version of the Christmas story. No shepherds, no Joseph and Mary, just Jesus, the baby, and two rather Rather unusual, and, but significant characters. Actually, one central character, and from a story perspective, his foil. Now, the subject headings in our Bibles don't really help us understand what Matthew is trying to communicate. The subject headings, as we know, were not part of the original text. They're added later for those of us who are somewhat ADD to see what's going on without having to look at it. So look at the paragraph headings. In, in your version, some of the versions, like the one I'm using, says, the Magi visit the Messiah. Later on, verse 13, the escape to Egypt. Verse 19, the return to Egypt. Some have those kind of headings. Several versions are a little bit less politically correct, less PG rated. They have wise men seek the king, flight to Egypt. And then the final one, massacre of the innocents. Herod kills the children. Ooh, if we're, if we're re reading to our kids before bedtime, that's a signal to stop right there, right? Now, those headings are all accurate in terms of what happens, but they all actually obscure the main point that Matthew's trying to get across. They don't, they don't help us to see there's one main human character in this count, this, this entire passage is all about one man 
and how he tried to cancel Christmas even after it happened. It's about King Herod's reaction to the plan of God in Jesus. Nine times in this chapter, in every single paragraph, Herod's name is there. He's the main character, the main human character in every single section of this story. Jesus' name, it's there only once, the first verse. When Jesus is referred to, he's almost always simply called the child. The wise men or magi, the ones who, who want to talk, who we want to talk about in terms of the plot, they're only the foil. They expose Herod for who he really is. They reveal for us how to respond in a different way than Herod to the plans of God in Jesus that becomes real in space and time at Christmas. Matthew actually just, well, he, he literally just glosses over the birth of Jesus. In the, in the end of chapter 1, beginning at verse 24, when Joseph woke up from this dream of the angel, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. That's it. One line, bare facts. She gave birth to a son. He gave him the name Jesus. A little newspaper announcement. It happened. It's what happened following the birth of Jesus that is what Matthew wants us to come to terms with. And so as we read this account, I'm, I'm going to ask that you, you pick up a pad of paper or use the notes section of your smartphone and, and listen for what it tells us about Christmas and, and the plans of God. I'll read it slowly. And to help you get into it, I'd like you to just jot down at least one lesson from this account that you hear and, and think about, and, and at least one question that this account raises about Christmas and the plans of God. So reading Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the chief people's chief priests and teachers of the law, we, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them till, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, Weeping 
and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. Okay. If you're watching this with someone, press pause right now and talk about one lesson and at least one question this chapter raises about Christmas and the plan of God. Take whatever time you need. We're not going away. All right. Let's dive in. We obviously won't surface or speak to all of the things that you came up with, but we're going to talk about one lesson and two questions. So first of all, the lesson. As we read this chapter, the the second page of what we call the New Testament, the record of the big news, the big new step in the unfolding of God's plan to recreate what humans screwed up. The big lesson in this chapter that we have to come that that we have to keep coming to terms with. Well, it's the one we've already put out there. You can't cancel the plans of God. That's what Matthew wants us to know and to make sure we are coming to terms with. That's why the magi Magi, which, which was a broad term for people in the ancient Near East who were into some combination of astronomy, astrology, and philosophy, depending on which of these were at the fore of their practice, many of them were legitimate seekers and thinkers, early scientists. And the observation of these astronomers, the reason the star is significant is that in following the stars, astronomers saw patterns. They saw patterns and and designs. They saw that the universe operated according to an order, a grand design, a plan, a purpose for it all. Magi looked at the universe and they also read the texts of other major religions of the day to see if, if what they said made sense regarding the plan that must be. They had witnessed a change in the universe which in their mind indicated a change in a plan, a star they had never seen before. And perhaps, perhaps they had read in the Hebrew scriptures that talked about a star who would be born. In the Greco-Roman world of their time, legend had it that, that by watching the stars, Babylonian magi had already predicted the rise of Alexander the Great and of Caesar Augustus. Perhaps in their research, they had come across the prediction by the, by the pagan prophet Balaam that God used to confront his people. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. A ruler will come out of Jacob. Here's a star out of Israel. And they want to learn more. And so... Matthew 2, it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is this one who is born king of the Jews? We saw his star, and we have come to to pay homage to him. These naive, seeking Magi come to the person that they think should know the most about what's going on in his kingdom. They go right to the top, the king, King Herod. Tell us about this new born king. What do you think the first readers of this text are thinking? From the get-go, it's like, uh uh-oh, this can't be good. These these magi magi genuinely want to discover God's plan, but, but they just knocked on the wrong door. This is not going to end well. You see, Herod, their king, was a half-blood Jew a puppet king under Rome. He had ruled the Jews at this time for 43 years, seven as governor. And and when Rome realized that the Jews needed to think of themselves as having a king, they said, okay, we'll make him king. By now they knew that Herod knew which side his bread was buttered on. And Herod did a whole lot of good things for the Jews. He built a magnificent temple so that they could do their formal worship. 
He had done a great job of resourcing them during a famine. But he was always a puppet to Rome. He would never lead them to uprise or to rise up against Rome. And number two, Herod was absolutely paranoid. If he even sniffed that someone might be thinking of undermining him. And he got worse toward the end of his life. He killed his favorite wife. And at least two or perhaps three of his sons. And several of his other close associates. Paranoid and powerful. With the backing of Rome. Not a good combination. And, and the tension gets more palpable. When you look at the question these magi asked. Where's the one who has been born king of the Jews? Look at that question closely. The, the question they ask is not where is the one who has born to become king. It's where is this one who is the born king of the Jews. Can you see how this presses the central button that would have made Herod flip out? One, one of the things that fed into his paranoia that woke him up at night in a cold sweat, was that no matter how much good he did for the people, he knew that in their hearts, they considered him a usurper, a, 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 an imposter. He was not really their king because he was not born king. He had likely heard of the scriptures which had predicted that one day a ruler would come that would be the born king from the line of David. And one motto that drove him on was not on my watch. He had a good gig going. And, and he knows that if this is true. His gig is up. And so, so he goes to the experts on the plans of God. And what is it he asks? Not whether the scriptures promise a king. Which tells me he probably knew about it. But where this Messiah. This one sent from God was to be born. And indeed in the many Hundreds, actually, of prophecies of this one who was to be born to rule the earth, not just Jews. There were several references to the town of David as his birthplace. Bethlehem, like Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And Herod sets about to do what had been tried many times before. He tries to cancel the plans of God. And so you've got several people who genuinely want, want to become, want to know God's plan. And on the other hand, a king whose one big goal is to cancel God's plan. The point of this whole account is to show that even though God's plan involves a vulnerable, helpless baby born to a powerless young couple, no powers on earth, no power in the universe can cancel the plan of God. And Jesus is the plan of God. Folks, whether we claim to know and follow Jesus or not, the number one thing we have to continue processing is, am I responding well to this birth? Am I responding well in this situation to the one who was born king over all the earth? Am I really following Jesus, surrendering to Jesus, submitting to Jesus, and allowing him to lead me through this situation? Or am I sitting on the sidelines or, or getting all kinds of static and losing connection in my head because he does not seem to be cooperating with my plans? You can't cancel the plan of God. And the plan of God is Jesus. You, you can't even talk about the plan of God for you in any situations without bumping into Jesus. So that, that's the lesson of this chapter. But this story also points to some of the huge issues, some tensions, big questions we have with this plan of God in Jesus and, and how it rolled out, how it's rolling out in our lives. This morning, we'll, we'll simply put two of those questions on the table. Think about questions from this, that this story surfaces about God's Christmas plan that can't be canceled. Questions that make us wonder whether God's plan is really as good as we want to believe. First, well, what's our default criticism? 
after we've reacted and confronted someone about a decision that was made that didn't go the way we wanted to go, after we've let off our steam and, 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 and our final stab is often this, okay, I get that I can't change it. I see why you did it, but the timing just sucks, right? Isn't that what we often struggle with about how God does or, or doesn't work with us and in us? Sometimes we don't blame God. We, we blame the people around us, the people who make decisions that impact us. You couldn't have picked a worse time to allow this to happen. God, I want to trust you, but if you're going to come through for me, now would be the time. The very first verse of the chapter puts the timing issue on the table. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, during the time of King Herod. And as the whole tension comes to a climax with the slaughter of the 20 innocent babies, that is a very real question, isn't it? It's even more stark when we realize that the timing God chose for Jesus' birth was toward the very end of Herod's life. When his paranoia had certainly become clinically diagnosable mental instability of some kind, it, it happened just, it happened probably about three years before Herod's death. It's like, really, God? It's almost over. Herod's going to die within several years. You've waited this long? Would three years really make that much difference? You know, we like exploring the way Luke's gospel talks about the timing of Jesus' birth. He, he talks about it in terms of another leader of the day who made a decision that impacted this birth. Quirinius, the, the governor, making a decree, not just a strong d d suggestion, a decree, a mandate that everything, regardless of their, everyone, regardless of their situation, had to, had to go to the ancestral home, their family, to be registered. And we love pointing out the fact that, that the census that forced Joseph to take very pregnant Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem, his ancestral birthplace, to register, which it just so happened was where the Old Testament scriptures had said Jesus was to be born. We love that. Joseph would never have come there at this time if it wasn't for the census. Isn't God's timing amazing? And, and we easily agree with Paul's observation in Galatians 4, but when the time had fully come, or as one translation says, at exactly the right time, the appropriate time in God's plans, God sent out his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law so that we might be adopted as sons with full rights at just the right time. We love that. But then we come to Matthew 2. Do you ever struggle with the timing of God's plans? I do. This week, LaDonna and I talked again about, for us, this whole COVID thing, combined with a few other things, could not have come at a worse time. We talked about what we don't see God doing. How do we handle that? Well, it it's not a question with a simple, tidy, black and white answer. God doesn't say there is. Actually, timing is a part of the context of that great statement we love to quote about God's plans from Isaiah chapter 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And in the context, that statement is all about timing. But would it help us if we could bring ourselves to, to flip that question? What if it say, what if we said, you know, this feels like it really sucks. This really puts a monkey wrench in my plans. But what might there be in the timing of this? that makes it the right time. In our text, how might the time of King Herod be the right time for the birth of Jesus? Well, what does this account tell us about God's timing? 
and how this actually might be the perfect time. Well, there's, there's at least two things. Number one, it puts it right out there from the get-go that nothing, nobody, not even the power of this Roman puppet king can keep God's plans for his true king from being born. And as we move on to Herod's reaction to it, killing of all the baby boys born in Bethlehem in a, in a certain time frame, nothing can keep God's plans from coming to fruition. But second, let's take that a step further, a step deeper for us. The fact that God's time for Jesus' birth was during the time of King Herod points to something for all of us. There is always some king in our life that is an imposter, that confronts our plans, that we think we have to please so life will work. And in the end, that king is actually me. These seekers had it right. The one who was born, was born king, deserves our homage, our worship. And as he grows, and as, as this young man begins to teach and perform miracles to show his power over his authority over all of nature, over illness, and even over death, it is very clear that what we are to see is that he was born king. And none of the powers can prevent that, even us. I love the way Sky Jatani tells us what this means. And this won't be the only time you hear the statement this Christmas season. He said, Jesus did not come to bring immediate peace. He came to divide us from our illegitimate allegiances. We like the messages, message of the angels in Luke, on earth, peace. But we forget the rest of that statement. On earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Who is it that is in God's favor? It's Matthew's account that helps us see it. Those like the wise men who see in Jesus the one we need to recognize as the only real king, the Lord of all the universe. It's not just Herod. The entire drama of God's story from beginning to end, God's story as we have it in the Bible, is the story really about two things. Number one, it's about kings and rulers how to try, how, who try to cancel God's plan for the Christmas that is to come. Think about Pharaoh and baby Moses in Exodus, which like Jesus' story, includes the killing of a lot of baby boys. Over and over again, a lot of kings before Herod discovered you can't mess with God's plan for and through his people, the Jesus who is to come. But second, it's also the story about a lot of people who were God's people, who didn't always believe God was going to pull it off, and so they gave up and gave in to the Herods. Or like Abraham, they try to help God out with his plan when they doubt his timing, his ability to pull it off, right? God doesn't give Abraham the son he promised. And so Abraham produced for God a son from a servant. How did that turn out? We're still living with the consequences of God's people who discover that when you mess with God's plans, you only mess with yourself. Can you see that as part of your experience? And after Jesus came, Herod was only the first of many who tried to cancel the reason for Christmas, probably the most famous of which was a man by the name of Saul, who was confronted by Jesus when he was trying to cancel the church. He was confronted by the risen Jesus who came to him and said, Saul, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. It's hard for you to stop the river of what I'm making happen. Saul gets it and submitted to Jesus as God's plan and, and became the key human reason why we're here today. Because he was the one God used to plant the church in the Western world. So what is it right now in your life in which timing has become a factor in preventing you from fully engaging God's plan? 
committing yourself to God's plan to live fully in and under Jesus. Maybe that's the place God is inviting you to see the king question. Who really is your king? It's Paul who puts the timing issue boldly for us. To the Corinthian church, he writes, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. It's going to happen someday when, when there's no more chance. Are you using the chance you have now? The time you have now to give yourself to Jesus? That's the timing question. But, but there's another huge question. This account clearly shows that God's plans can't be canceled. Another question, it surfaces. We're going to speak to it briefly. And the question is, what about all that collateral damage? The killing of the innocent kids. How can you say God's plan is good when it caused so many tears, so much pain? Even in this account, God very directly, clearly steps in and intervenes to protect his child. Okay, we get that. But he also very directly intervenes to protect the Magi and does not step in on behalf of the young families of Bethlehem. Does that bother you? I've been on both sides of that kind of experience, and I'm sure you have too. God opens doors for me when he doesn't for others. It's so easy to, to, to buy into the, well, you know, I must be doing something right line. But inside, I know that's not it. Because I've also been on the other side. God opening doors for pouring blessing on others when he's not doing it for me. How do we come to terms with that? Well, again, there are no simple answers. Let me just make several statements which, which don't really change the horror of this nor even our feelings about it, but they are true statements that we need to factor in regarding how we think about this story. Number one, God did not cause this evil. It is an example in the story of the one God sends, of the results of humanity trying to go it alone, independent of God, and making themselves the center. It's an example of the extreme results of that. And so it's an example of exactly what it is that Jesus came into this world to resolve. It's how these readers were originally to understand this because he quotes from the prophet Jeremiah which promises that there will come a time when these tears will end. But what about those mothers and fathers of Bethlehem? Can you imagine how those parents would have felt toward Mary? as her child was growing up, and theirs never would. It's like, why didn't you warn us when God warned you, right? Can you imagine when Jesus became popular as a teacher and people are flocking to him, would not that just have been like a twist of a knife in their hearts? Why does his mother get to have a proud heart? And I have to live a lifetime with an aching heart because of him. I wonder how many of them might have sometimes wanted to say to Jesus, if you really come from God, why would I want that kind of God who did this to me? And then, I wonder if it would have made any difference for those mothers and fathers, when they saw this one who had been preserved from death, brutally murdered, more painfully and shamefully than their own children. I wonder if they would have thought of the prophecy from Isaiah of this one 
who was to come. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, and yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds, we are healed. I wonder if, as they saw the sign nailed to the cross, King of the Jews, I wonder if they thought of the question that the Magi asked at Christmas time Where is he that is born King of the Jews? Would they have been able to see that Jesus is the God who sees their tears? who cares about their tears, who weeps himself for their tears, it breaks his heart, who meets us in our tears, and who promises that because he was born, that one day, as Jesus says in John 16, your grief will turn to joy. I wonder if they would have been able to understand as John, based on Jesus' promise, tells us that one day he will wipe away all tears. Andrew Peterson has a song that is called After the Last Tear Falls. Listen to some of the lines from that song. In the end, we'll see how the tears that have fallen were caught in the nail-scarred palms of the giver of love and the lover of all. And we'll look back on these tears as old tales. It's very clear in Matthew's account that the reason Matthew has the gall and the insight to start Jesus' story the way he does is that Matthew has come to terms with the meaning of how Jesus' life ends. You see, the one thing that matters this Christmas is that Christmas is not canceled. It happens, which means that the plans of God cannot ever be canceled. It is a central affirmation in history of that wonderful promise from Psalm 33 the Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Because of Jesus, it's no longer next man up. It's all about last man standing. And we know from the book of Revelation, the message of which is nothing and nobody can cancel the plans of God, and the plan of God is still Jesus. I am, it says, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is and the one who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Jesus is the one who will be left standing, and he invites us to know that we are standing in him. I don't know what COVID Christmas is bringing you or is canceling for you. But will you go into it resting in, rejoicing in, surrendering into the plan that will not be canceled? Thank you for joining us this week to Ellerslie Online. If you haven't already, please subscribe to YouTube, follow us on Facebook, and we'd love to interact more with you. Let's let God have the last word. This is from Psalm 33, verses 10 and 11. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. 
He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Have a wonderful week, everybody. We'll see you next Sunday. I search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise and Treasures that fade Are never enough and You came along And put me back together Every desire is now satisfied. Here you are. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. The God of the mountain is the God in the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Nothing is better than you.